Thank you. I'm glad that you're here and that we can uh, be together um, this evening to continue uh, the second part of our uh, discussion that is focused, helping us to focus on perspectives on conflict, religion, and identity um, in the Holy Land. I'm going to offer a blessing for the food, and as part of that blessing, I'm going to include um, a prayer that was written by a rabbi that I came across today that I thought helped to express some of the, the sentiment for what we all hope will be the case in that part of the world. Let us pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for this evening, for the blessing of food that we have received, and we pray that it will nourish our bodies. Sustain together in undiminished hope, O God of hope, those who continue to labor with undiminished determination to build peace in the land from which out of brokenness, violence, and destruction, hope emerged for so many of faith. Bless all the spiritual seed of Abraham together with the light of your presence. For in the light of your presence, we have found a way of justice and mercy and a vision of peace. We praise you, O God, giver of peace, who commands us to peace. Amen. 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 It's a privilege for me to be able to introduce to you Dr. Chris Knapp. <laughs> Uh, Christer is a teaching professor in the Department of History at WashU, where he offers courses in national security and U.S. foreign policy. The title for his uh, uh, presentation tonight is Assessing Conflict and U.S. Security Policy um, in the Middle East. Uh, professor Knapp uh, regularly serves as a resident WashU expert and gives talks within the greater St. Louis community. And when he and I were communicating earlier, he mentioned that he had, um, has done things like this at uh, Ladue Chapel um, in, the, in the neighborhood. So welcome, welcome back to this, to this part of the area. Um, he is also the coordinator for, uh, for the lecture series Crisis and Conflict in Historical Perspective. Um, he's been interviewed and has appeared on uh, numerous local television and radio affiliates um, and internationally on the BBC. So it's a real privilege to have um, uh, Professor Knapp with us. Christopher, thank you so much for being, uh, for being at St. Peter's and welcome. Oh, thank you for having me. Can you all hear me? Great. Uh, it's a delight to be here. I'd like to thank um, Father Hodges, David. Uh, uh, for inviting me here uh, to be here in this uh, lovely building on this lovely evening and hopefully we can get toward peace um, or maybe something just short of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Connor for his great services tonight uh, managing uh, the AV. So it's great to see you all on this uh, evening. So I will talk for about 30, 35 minutes or so and we'll flo throw open the floor for questions. So I'm going to assess conflict in the Middle East and particularly U.S. policy uh, and U.S. national security policy. And um, my plan is to identify what that policy is. You've probably been reading a lot in the newspapers and online and in social media, trying to understand what all these conflicts are, what the Biden administration's policy is, why the United States engages in the behavior in the Middle East that it does, and where we're likely headed. So I want to look at all of those things. Um, and before we uh, actually get to that, <clears throat> I should just say outright that I don't play for any team. So I'm not here to praise or bury the Biden administration. I'm here to try to explain and assess what's going on and why and how to try to give you the best possible understanding as I understand it as to this, uh, this uh, complex dynamic that we're facing in the Middle East right now so that you can use that to inform your own decisions. Um, so I think before we get to policy and, and get to the an analysis, we need to first start with understanding the conflicts that are occurring in the Middle East. Now, many of you will be familiar with the October 7th attacks uh, just this past fall uh, in Israel by Hamas, but that is really only the first of five conflicts currently taking place in the Middle East, and they're all related. Mm -hmm. And what I wanna to try to do is run you through each of these five relatively quickly, and then show you at the end how they're all connected. And they're connected to one common denominator, and that's the country of Iran. And so we'll talk to that, uh, we'll talk, I'll speak to that, and then we'll get into the policy and the analysis. So before the, we understand the US side, let's understand what's happening on the ground in Israel, excuse me, in, in the Middle East. 
We begin with Israel, with the Israeli-Hamas conflict in Gaza. Um, and so you have a map in front of you on the table, and then it's up here as well uh, in red, right here down in the southern part uh, in Gaza. So we know on October 7th, um, Hamas fired thousands of rockets into Israeli cities and towns and invaded southern Israel, killing 1,200 Israeli Jews and foreign nationals, including some Americans, by the way, uh, while um, raping, torturing, and wounding still more. They took over 230 hostages back into Gaza, and we know that Israel then retaliated by invading the Gaza Strip uh, and bombing it that has so far destroyed one-third of the infrastructure in Gaza and two-thirds of the northern half of Gaza. Those strikes and ground assaults have resulted in approximately 9,000 Hamas fighters killed, which is about 30% of their 30,000 uh, fighter strong force, um, but has also resulted in the deaths of approximately 30,000 of the 2.2 Palestinians hunkering down in the south. While some of those Palestinians have connections to Hamas, many of them do not. Most of those that have been killed or wounded are women and children. This is all something we've been following in the news and thinking and praying and suffering over. Safe passages and safe zones have been hard to come by for Palestinians. Humanitarian aid is slow uh, in arriving and often insufficient. And there are multiple reports of human rights violations. Now we know that there has been one temporary pause in five months of fighting. Uh, to exchange hostages, and another is currently being negotiated, but so far they have not reached uh, uh, an agreement on that. Now in the meantime, some of the hostages have died. Despite pressure from the Biden administration to force Israel to halt its military campaign, or at least to dial down, dial back its campaign, um, even as Hamas continues to fire rockets into Israel, which many of you may not know or fully understand, Hamas is still fighting. Um, despite all that, the Israeli government has vowed to continue its war until it has degraded Hamas to the point where Hamas is no longer a threat to Israel. So after 9-11, we said no more 9-11s, and we went abroad to go after terrorists to make sure they could never attack us again. That is precisely what the Israeli security establishment is trying to do. They're going after Hamas to no more October 7th. You've heard this, this phrase about uh, eliminating Hamas. That's near impossible for any terrorist organization. But you can degrade it to the point where it's no longer able to attack Israel. And that's really what the goal is. How long will this take? Israel has not said. <coughs> Rough outlines of the plans of what comes after the fighting ends have begun to emerge. But right now, there is no agreement as to what the day after, quote unquote, will look like. And there is no end in sight to this conflict, as both sides are still willing to fight on. And so as long as they are willing to fight on, this is a conflict without end for the moment. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the first conflict. The second conflict involves Israel and Hezbollah, which is up in the northern part, Israel's northern border with southern Lebanon. So. These two, uh, Israel and Hezbollah, are fighting along the Israeli-Lebanese border. Now, Hamas attacked Israel from the south, hoping to incite Hezbollah uh, to attack from the north and thereby force Israel to fight a two-front war. Hezbollah has an estimated 150,000 rockets and ballistic missiles. Ballistic missiles have the accuracy with GPS, and they can hit any city in any part inside of Israel. Uh, and so uh, Hamas was hoping that when they attacked from the south, Hezbollah would launch a full-on scale attack on Israel from the north. But Hezbollah was not then seeking a full-scale war with Israel. And being mindful of major U.S. military reprisals from aircraft, uh, an aircraft carrier fleet in the Mediterranean that the Biden administration had moved off of Israel's shore, Hezbollah settled for a more measured set of missile strikes. So uh, that's Hezbollah's side. Now, fearing a full-fledged invasion, Israel, looking at what happened with Gaza, thought, well, Hezbollah is going to attack. And so just like after 9-11, we were very concerned about a second strike, right? Another planes operation. So Israel looks at this situation with the same kind of uh, 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 fear. 
So fearing a full-fledged invasion from Hezbollah, some members of the Israeli war cabinet have argued for a major preemptive strike on Hezbollah so as to avoid being caught off guard a second time, just as they were on October 7th. But instead, wiser heads have prevailed, and uh, Israel has opted also for measured retaliatory miss missile strikes that until at least last week, um, uh, it has, it has um, uh, maintained. In fact, last week, Israel launched a missile strike against Hezbollah weapons depots, which is 30 miles inside of southern Lebanon. So that's not along the border. But otherwise, the two have fired 150 missiles along the border that have killed 250 people. The slide on your left, uh, whoops, the slide on your left right here, this is where all of the missile attacks are on the border, including some in the Golan Heights. 150,000 locals, 80,000 on the Israeli side, 70,000 on the Lebanese side, would living within two miles of that border have all been evacuated to avoid further bloodshed. Israel has also conducted uh, airstrikes against Iranian-backed Syrian mil uh, militants operating in western Syria uh, uh, who act as Hezbollah's proxy force. Now since Hezbollah is in violation of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1701, which ended Israel's war in Lebanon in 2006 and stipulates that Hezbollah's military forces are supposed to stay behind a line along the Latani River, which is about right here. So Hezbollah should be up here, but it has its forces all along the border here and is in violation of that UN Security Council resolution. Why is Hezbollah there? Well, it sees its stance as a defense against uh, another invasion from Israel for, uh, into southern Lebanon, but Israel sees Hezbollah's presence along the border as a direct threat to their own security. And so you have a security paradox. There's little diplomacy occurring between either side to end this conflict, and it too could easily intensify at any moment into a full-scale war, including potentially into the Golan Heights and even Syria proper. So that's the second war. The third conflict is between the Houthis and the United States, which is occurring down here in the Red Sea off of Yemen's western coast. The Houthis are a militia group from the country's minority Twelver Shia sect. The Shias are a minority within the majority Sunni uh, um, uh, 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 of Islam. But within the Shia sect, there are subsects, and the Twelver sect is what uh, Houthis are. And they currently occupy about 40% of Yemen, which is this orange splotch right here in the west. That includes the capital, Sana'a, which is about right here. They were at war, the Houthis, with Saudi Arabia, which is to Yemen's north, for eight years, from 2014 to 2022. And they were at war after throwing President Abdullah Saleh, a Sunni strongman who had ruled Yemen for 30 years and was trying to tamp down the Houthis and the Shia influence in the government. And the United States backed Saleh. He was helpful for us for our, our war on terrorism in Yemen, um, but he was also fighting the Houthis, the minority there in that country. The problem, however, is that the Saudi war failed the Houthis came out victorious, the Saudis gave up and left, and the Sudis have only gone, grown stronger as they are fully armed and backed by the state of Iran. And so they have consolidated their gains, even as most of the country has slipped further into abject misery due to the ravages of war. Indeed, Yemen is considered a failed state and one of the worst uh, on, uh, uh, in the world. After the October 7th attacks occurred, the US vowed to, and the US vowed to support Israel, the Houthis decided to fire rockets and launch drone strikes at Israel in support of and in solidarity with Hamas and Hezbollah. So this uh, red arrow right here is one of those attempted strikes. That strike, however, was shot down by US ships right, that patrol the Red Sea. So U.S. naval vessels intercepted those missiles and shot down the drones. The Houthis then decided to fire missiles, of which they have tens of thousands, 
at commercial ships that are sailing, sailing in nearby waters. And the goal of firing at these ships is to interrupt, if not shut down, international shipping lanes that run along the Arabian Sea. So you have the sea coming in here to the Gulf of Aden, the Indian Ocean down below, and then up through the Bab al-Mandan Strait along Yemen's western coast through the Red Sea, all the way up to the Suez Canal and into the Mediterranean, and thus to all points in the Middle East, North Africa, and Europe. So uh, if you shut down those shipping lanes, you force all of the ships to go south off your map, right, way down below Africa and the Cape of Good Hope. So that causes uh, uh, delays uh, ships, it takes them three weeks longer to get to their port. That drives up costs because of fuel, that takes goods longer to get there. That has added to the inflation that you see at Schnucks. <laughs> you, all, you all shop at Schnucks, right? Okay. Um, so, um, so the US uh, and its coalition partners, seeing this as an egregious violation of free shipping norms and a front to free trade, decided to interdict ships uh, carrying missiles and components from Iran. So Iran sends its missiles through the waters uh, to Yemen. And we have interdicted a number of ships over the years. Um, and unfortunately, there was one that resulted in the death of two Navy SEALs about a month ago who died by drowning while trying to board one of those ships in the Gulf of Aden. Now, the U.S. has been shooting down Houthi missiles, and so the Houthis decided to fire missiles at U.S. ships directly, right, which Navy vessels have intercepted. So when you look at this lower map here, these are strikes in the Red Sea by the Houthis against commercial ships, and the black is the U.S. Uh, counter-strikes against Houthi positions inside Yemen. So uh, this, is, this is what's been happening uh, there. Um, and so the Biden administration has ordered naval forces to strike Houthi missile launch sites, command and control centers, underground missile storage bases to deter the Houthis from launching more missiles, right? So every time they try to launch a missile, that means a radar machine comes on. We know where that radar machine is. We rain down ordnance, end of missile. It's a, it's a, but it's a you know, whack-a-mole kind of game. Um, there have been at least six rounds of these deterrent strikes at over 100 targets. And so far, the strategy seems to be working since the Houthis have uh, drastically slowed uh, their missile attacks on ships and U.S. naval vessels in the Red Sea. However, the Houthis have said they will only stop firing missiles once the fighting in Gaza ceases. And since we don't know when the fighting in Gaza is going to cease, I think it's fair to assume the Houthis will resume some of their strikes. Uh, and so there's really no end to this uh, problem as well. So that's the third conflict. The fourth conflict is between the United States and Shia militia groups that operate in Iraq. They're Iraqi citizens. They operate in Syria too. But they are Shia, not Sunni. And they are backed by Iran, which is a Shia state. And there are dozens of these groups. Some of them have local concerns. They view themselves as players in the Iraqi political system. But others are what we call transnational groups. They are more interested in affecting international change. And the most well-known of these goes back to the 1980s, around the same time that Hezbollah was created in Lebanon, which is called Lebanese Hezbollah. Another Hezbollah group, Party of God, was created in Iraq. And that group is called Kaitab Hezbollah. And you may have heard about this group if you've been reading very carefully. But most of us probably have not. And that is the group that has been striking US military personnel that are based at 12 different Iraqi bases in, in Iraq and in Syria and in Jordan. And so, um, so the US and Shia militia groups uh, are fighting one another. And Kaitab Hezbollah has so far conducted over 160 rocket and missile attacks at US military personnel. And that's what this slide is. These are bases right here in the black circles. And these red squares are the number of strikes that have occurred on those bases. Each one of these bases has US military personnel and or uh, military contractors. They are in Iraq and, and Syria by invitation, at least in Iraq by the Iraqi government, a nominal ally, one of the few good things to come out of the US war in Iraq, um, because we, they are there to help protect uh, the return of ISIS. And 
We also have 900 special forces operating in Syria, which are to also protect against uh, the return of ISIS. There are about 8,000 ISIS fighters sitting in a prison in, in northeastern Syria, and about um, maybe more like 5,000 fighters, and there are about 8,500 uh, uh, wives and children of ISIS, former ISIS fighters who are sitting in refugee camps in, in, in Syria. So there's a concern about the return of, of ISIS. So in any event, Kaitab Hezbollah is firing on these bases, and they have killed three American personnel at Tower 22 in Jordan, uh, which is um, right here on your map in the very upper corner of Jordan between Syria and Iraq. And they have wounded 75 more. So it is not uh, always necessarily a safe place for U.S. military personnel right now. So this has led to U.S. reprisal strikes using long-range bombers that released 125 precision munitions on 85 targets in seven locations in just over 30 minutes. And that is what this uh, uh, slide down here is with these strikes right here. This is the Euphrates River Valley right in here. And that's where a lot of these groups have their munitions and their rockets and their logistics. And our attempt is to take out their logistic um, train, their supply chain. Uh, and so um, we've done that. Um, we have also, uh, this, is, this is violent stuff. We, we've also used what's called a switchblade drone. This is a drone that releases sharp knives instead of explodes when it strikes. Yes, I know. And we've killed the leader of Kaitab Habola. While he was driving his car in the middle of the day in East Baghdad, there was no collateral damage because these drones are very precise. I mean, these missiles. So these missiles have quieted Islamic militias for now. Particularly, we just read a story the other day in either the Journal or the Times that said that Iran has told them to quit it, and they have. But they remain armed, and they have over 30,000 fighters, and conflict there could resume at any time as well. And then finally, there is, as I already alluded to, U.S. counterterrorism efforts against ISIS in western Iraq and eastern Syria, um, where ISIS still has active fighters. Um, but ISIS is not only interested in gaining control of Iraq and Syria again. It, as a Sunni group, it is also the sworn enemy of Iran, which again is a Shia-led state. And so um, uh, it is a threat to Iran, uh, a Persian power, right, with a Shia Muslim leadership. And so to demonstrate its threat, ISIS has attacked Iran on several occasions, most notably by exploding two IEDs at a parade memorial for General Qasem Soleimani, the former leader of the elite's Quds forces. Now, the U.S. had actually killed Soleimani in January 2020 in Baghdad with a drone strike. Uh, but ISIS attacked Iran when they were having a memorial parade for him on the fourth anniversary of his death. And that strike killed 80 people and wounded over 300. So ISIS is at war with Iran, and Iran is at war with ISIS. So indeed, they retaliated with ballistic missile strikes uh, in eastern Syria. I could go on and on. Pakistan and Iran have exchanged missiles in Baluchistan, which is a region that separates um, Iran and Pakistan. There are many conflicts, but all of these conflicts trace back to one common origin, and that, of course, is Iran. Now, more accurately, while each of these groups has, uh, well, each of these groups um, has, its, has differing ideologies and different political goals, some local, some transnational. They are all funded, they are all trained, and they are all armed by Iran. They pick their own operations, they have their own politics, they have their own local concerns, but they would not be able to conduct those operations without support from Iran. Without Iran, none of these groups, Hamas, Hezbollah, the Houthis, Kaitab Hezbollah, to name just four, could arm themselves. They could not launch these strikes against Israel. They could not launch strikes against the U.S. bases. They could not launch strikes in any of these places that I've gone over. So um, they rely on Iran to support their operations. They are then Iran's proxies. And I would go further following some analysis I saw this afternoon to suggest, to suggest that Hezbollah is such a strong group that it's really more of a partner with Iran 
because Hezbollah is a state within a failed state of Iran. It provides social services, it has, it has members in the Lebanese parliament, and it basically controls southern Lebanon. It has thousands and thousands of fighters, it, has, it trains fighters for other militias. Um, it is really not just a proxy group, it's a partner. And so it is, it is a viable force. So these groups really need Iran. Um, they also, all of them, all of them, are opposed to Israel's existence. They also um, see U.S. support of Israel as the main obstacle to van vanquishing Israel. So when Iranian leaders get up in the morning, besides preserving their regime and preserving their state, their goal is to get rid of the U.S. out of the Middle East so they can push Israel into the Mediterranean. And that's what these militias do. They act on behalf of Iran that will not go to direct war with Israel, but will use these proxy groups on behalf of its national interests to advance its foreign policy to go after Israel. But the United States stands in the way, right? And so they start attacking U.S., right? The U.S. has attacked U.S. interests um, with a ballistic missile strike on, on um, al-Assad Air Base, where U.S. military contractors are stationed and who work in support of Operation Inherent Resolve to suppress ISIS. We had to use 15 of our own Patriot missiles to shoot down incoming Iranian missiles at Americans in Iraq. We're in, a pro we're in an indirect shadow war with Iran right now. It's already happening. It's just low-level, low-intensity conflict. They've also shot at Israeli outposts in Iraq, uh, a, a supposed spy post. And so we have retaliated by launching missile strikes against Iranian weapons storage facilities in Syria. And Israel, of course, frequently want, want, uh, launches strikes against uh, um, Iranian assets that work inside of Syria, with, which is one of Iran's allies in the region. So in essence, then, the United States and Israel have been engaged in a low-level conflict with Iran. And this goes back 40 years to the revolution uh, in 1979. Now, like the other five conflicts, this main conflict is the one that analysts worry about the most, because this is the one that could spiral out of control into a major war in the Middle East. As bad as the conflict is in Gaza, which is what the one that most of us know about and think about, the much more dangerous one would be a conflict uh, getting wider with Iran. So the others seem manageable, at least for now. But since all of them are interconnected, right, via Iran, any one or combination of them that flares up can cause flare-ups in the other. And this is the nightmare scenario that the Amer American administration has to manage. This is a tough problem, right? This is, a, well, this is what we call a hard problem in foreign policy. So that's the background dynamics. Let's look at why the U.S. has interest in the Middle East, what the Biden's policy has been, um, and then um, we'll get to questions. So the U.S. has many strategic interests in the Middle East that revolve around politics and economics. We, we want to make sure it remains stable and secure. And so these are nominally the, th the following, right? We want to protect our U.S. allies, obviously Israel, but nominally Iraq, too. Uh, we want to support the proliferation of democracy and free societies, and there aren't many in the Middle East, but we it is still our official policy to do that. We certainly want to promote free trade, open markets, and investments. That's good for the people of the Middle East, and it's good for the region, it's good for the United States. We promote energy development, such as the stable flow of reliable, consistent, and affordable oil, particularly Brent crude that comes out of the uh, Arabian Peninsula and the whole oil corridor there, but also natural gas and pipelines, which efficiently and effectively move this energy resources around the region and out the, out the rest of the world. Now, I should point out, we consume very little Middle East oil. We are now a major exporter of energy to the world. Um, it's other countries like Europe and that are allies with us that need this oil. So we make sure the oil flows. Um, we promote stability and development through state capacity building. Not necessarily nation building, but helping states improve their governance, uh, reduce their corruption, and so they can meet the needs of their people better with their programs. At least that's the policy goal. That's our interest. Um, we provide and maintain security through military deterrence. We have the seventh, uh, we have the sixth and the fifth naval fleets in the Mediterranean and the and the Arabian Gulf. We have military bases, naval bases. Um, all over the place, and we have troops by invitation in many different countries. Our 
partners and so forth. And that helps create a deterrence. So we're, we, we alliance and partnership building are part of our interests. And of course, we're there to maintain uh, open shipping lanes on which free trade and energy rely. So that's been a long-standing Middle East policy, at least since the Carter administration, but perhaps even the Nixon administration. So I'd say for the last half decade or so. What, what is Biden's Middle East policy? Because there has been a notable uh, change over the, uh, since the last three administrations. So President Biden's Middle East policy is best captured in what we call the national security strategy. And I don't have a slide for you, but every administration puts out like a white paper or an official document when they, when they, about a year into their administration, when it lays out their security vision for the United States and its role in the world. So it's called the National Security Strategy. And the Biden administration released theirs in 2022. Um, and so what's interesting about this is its notable departure from the Bush, Obama, and Trump administrations when it comes to the Middle East. The Biden's uh, NSS eschews changing regimes or making societies in the, remaking societies in the Middle East. It, it's done with that. Um, that's, that's what we tried in Iraq and Afghanistan. Those were, those were not good outcomes. That's what marked U.S. foreign policy for the first two decades of the 21st century. Instead, the Biden administration sought to establish something of a new framework to create a greater long-term stability in the region. If we want peace, work for stability, one step at a time, just like Kissinger said. You don't get peace with a long, with one swing, a grand slam. You have to do it incrementally, bit by bit by bit. And the first step is to try to create uh, stability. St stability can create opportunity, political, economic, social, religious, etc., and thus prosperity um, for people in the Middle East. So to ensure foundational stability, the Biden administration also eschews relying on military-centric policies and military-centric practices, such as those that dominated the global war on terrorism um, in favor of other strengths. It wants to look at other tools in our statecraft toolbox, like diplomacy, alliances, established coalitions, partnership building, economic investment, free trade, technological exchanges, cultural exchanges, educational exchanges. And so the policy is to de-escalate tensions in the region and promote greater stability in the region. And so toward that end, the Biden administration had five main goals in mind. The first was to strengthen partnerships with countries that were committed to play by what we call the rules-based order. If you followed international law, if you engage in free and fair trade, if you, if you promoted democracy or at least open societies and free and fair elections, and the usual list of sort of Western values and practices, something along the rules-based order, then we would invest in you and that would be good for your country. So we would strengthen those partners. Another goal of the administration was to protect freedom of navigation of the seas and the waterways so that commerce and oil would flow. Still a third was to reduce tensions and de-escalate conflicts rather than inflame conflicts. We wanted to promote regional and political and economic integration. And of course, we've been trying to promote human rights and values that are enshrined in the UN Charter. Now those are goals. Those are not necessarily things that have been achieved, but those have been goals. So given the policy of investing in the region and using diplomacy and trying to achieve those goals, what has the United States under the Biden administration actually done in the Middle East to try to bring about this outcome. In practice, what this has meant has been ending the U.S. war in Afghanistan. Now, Afghanistan is not technically in the Middle East, it's in Central Asia, but, you know, we fudge that and we say we fought two wars in the Middle East. So they ended the war in Afghanistan. Um, some of you may not know that while the Biden administration tried to restart the nuclear deal that we had with Iran that was formed under the Obama administration and canceled under the Trump administration, known as the JCPOA or the Iran nuclear deal, um, the Biden administration was unable to restart that to, to its satisfaction. But it didn't give up working with Iran. It's been very quietly working with Iran to keep Iran from weaponizing its enriched uranium below 90%, which is to say below bomb le level, so they don't, won't have a nuclear weapon. Now, why would Iran work with the US on this? Um, because we've had hostage exchanges, and we have freed up $8 billion in frozen Iranian assets. And because the Iran has been heavily sanctioned for two decades now, Iran was very eager to get asset to, uh, access to that money. 
Another thing the Biden administration did was to work to end the war in Yemen between the Saudis and the Houthis, which I mentioned was very devastating for Yemen and went nowhere, in order to get humanitarian relief to millions of suffering Yemenis. The Biden administration looked at the situation and it said, if we stop the war, the Houthis will let aid in ships into the ports that will allow aid to get to people who need it, medical supplies, food, etc. So that was another thing they, they did. They've been working to prevent the export of terrorism from Yemen, Syria, and Libya. Um, and they've been, the last, and these last three are what's most important and germane the most to our, to our, to our talk tonight. <clears throat> Number one, the Biden administration has been very consistent in promoting a viable two-state solution between Israel and Palestine. Understanding that during the war on terrorism years, that issue went on the back burner. But many people understand that if you want peace in the Middle East, if you want even stability in the Middle East, it goes through this issue. And so we cannot keep pushing this issue off the stage. Such was, has been the U.S. position for 40 years now across both Democratic and um, Republican administrations. So they promote the two-state solution. They have supported the Trump-era Abraham Accords. This was an important achievement in the last administration that normalized diplomatic relations between Israel and four key Arab states, the United Arab Emirates, which is right above Oman there, UAE, uh, Bahrain, which is in the Gulf, uh, Persian Gulf, uh, Sudan in Africa, and Morocco in North Africa. And that the United States, most importantly, was working on brokering a similar deal between Israel and Saudi Arabia. And all of this is important because if Israel and the Arab states could normalize relations, you would open the door to the beginning of stability, which is the beginning of peace, right? For three quarters of a century, there's been conflict between Arabs and Jews, between Arab states and the Israeli state, right? But if you could normalize relations, right, uh, or at through at least improving contact, then you could create that stability that would allow for economic growth and you would start to get beyond this conflict. That's not yet peace, but that's a lot better than what we've had. And so until October 7th, this policy seemed to be working. Most of the actors that I've talked about tonight were making progress. They were in agreement on this kind of um, uh, arrangement going forward and they were making progress toward these goals and conflict remained low. As Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, said just eight days before the October 7th attack, and I quote, the Middle East is quieter today than it has been in two decades, end quote. And he wasn't wrong, but he did have to walk back those comments. <laughs> so after the October 7th attack, the Biden administration thought they could contain the fallout to just Israel and Gaza. You remember that way back in the fall? Let's just keep it here including Israelis' subsequent military reprisals. Even as the administration supported Israel's right to defend itself and its right to go after uh, Hamas, it also wanted to prevent the rest of the region from going up in smoke. And so toward that end, we know the U.S. moved two aircraft carrier fleets uh, into the region uh, um, off the shores of, of Israel, as I mentioned, and it warned all belligerents in the region. Remember, President Biden said to Hezbollah, don't. Don't. And so far they've kept it to just those, those border strikes. As bad as this is, this is what it's been contained to, rather than Hezbollah firing rock rockets into all of Israel. That's what containment of a problem looks like. It's not the absence of conflict. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's not the absence of conflict, but it's keeping it minimized. So, um, so that's sort of, that, that's sort of uh, where we stand on that. On the other hand, it turned out to be a bit of wishful thinking, did it not? I just showed you five conflicts. And so if the central goal of the Biden's 2022 national security statement was to de-escalate tensions and to strengthen deterrence in the region to prevent conflicts, well, then Hamas's attack and subsequent events, which I've just walked you through, that have led to these five conflicts have severely tested the Biden administration's strategy. It must be very stressful in the White House, right, on just this issue alone, not to mention Ukraine, China, North Korea's nuclear weapons, et cetera, the border, and so forth. Really, this conflict, all these conflicts, have tested, if not actually undermined, U.S. deterrence in the region. And so Iran and many non-state actors 
have decided to take advantage of the security vacuum. And that's why we have the mess that we have today. So going forward, and then I'll finish up here and throw open the floor for questions. The challenge for the Biden administration going forward will be to see if they can put the proverbial genie back in the bottle. Can they reestablish credible deterrence so that all these other groups that are engaging in these attacks halt, stop, or cease altogether, you know, and thus, and, and thus reduce these conflicts and the violence? Without the restoration of deterrence, the situation will surely worsen. This is what we've been witnessing. For Biden, that will mean revisiting his Middle East policy to see what, if any, parts he wants to continue to continue pursuing and which ones he deems no longer applicable. Now here's my analysis. Given the president's low tolerance for risk, I think he does not have high tolerance for risk. I think he has some tolerance for risk, but not high tolerance for risk. Now that may be a good thing because in national security and foreign policy, you're often presented with minimal choices and they're almost all bad. And so you usually take the less risky one. Republicans and Democrats do this all the time. So given his low tolerance for risk and his administration's insistence on continuity, a safe bet would be to look for more of the same. Continuity rather than rupture in the Biden policy going forward. If I'm right about that, this would explain why they're doing the following things. Their low tolerance for risk and their continuity would explain why they continue to seek to de-escalate Israel and Hamas and not go after Hamas themselves. They could, Americans were killed. We have a legal right to do that if we wanted to, but that would inflame the situation, not de-escalate it, right? And so we've called for a pause in fighting. We want to negotiate a hostage release. We support humanitarian aid. Now you could argue that Biden's not doing it enough. He's not doing it well enough. He's not pressing Bibi hard enough, right? Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He's not doing, you could argue, wherever your position, but that is what they're trying to do. He's continuing to call for a two-state solution between Israel and Palestine. They continue to support and work for normalization of Israeli-Saudi relations, right? They're not going to invade Yemen to unseat the Houthis. That would escalate and put boot, boots on the ground. We would be in another Middle Eastern war. That is not Biden's security position. We're not going to do that in Iran. We are not going to war with Iran, right? Uh, and, but we will continue to work with Iran to quietly contain its nuclear program. And after all, Iran getting a nuclear weapon is a much bigger deal than these other things. So in conclusion, we are seeing continuity, not revision or rupture to Biden's Middle East policy that goes back two plus years. Thus, there's not likely to be a major change in strategy despite the October 7th attacks or any of the above events. And with that, I'll take your questions. Thank you. I believe there's a microphone coming around. Thank you. That's really interesting. I appreciate it. I, I have a question about the two-state solution. And so it's my understanding that the Palestinians came out of the Oslo Accords with the belief that they had a deal to evolve into or work into a two-state solution. Obviously, the Israelis didn't. What, what happened with that? Yarafat balked. Say it again? Yar, the Yasser the Arafat balked. Tell me what that means. So, um, Ehud Barak, then Prime Minister of Israel, and Yasser Arafat, then the nominal leader of the Palestinians, met at Camp David in 2000 when pres in the late Clinton administration. And that, if you remember back then, and we've all been around most of us, long enough to remember this. The initial reports coming in in the media in those days when we used to read hard copies of the paper was actually pretty glowing. And then as the week wore on, the mood changed. And by the end of the week, we thought we had this great deal. And it turned out that Arafat wouldn't sign the deal because the two sections, the West Bank and the Gaza, were not contiguous. Ehud Barak also balked because he felt that he couldn't totally trust uh, Yasser Arafat, um, who had made a career as a terrorist after all, but had supposedly renounced terrorism in favor of, uh, uh, of politics, um, that, that, that he couldn't trust this land for peace deal. So in the end, both men backed down, and that's as closest we ever got 
in 75 years to a two-state solution. Now, whether that two-state solution could have worked or not is, is a different matter. But that, I'd say the Oslo Accords followed by the Camp David talks were as close as we got. Yeah. You touched briefly on it, but underlying all of this is a significant conflict between the Shia and the Sunni uh, sect. Yeah. Is there any possible resolution that prevents Iran, which is, which is uh, Sunni, Shia. Shia, I'm sorry, going after uh, Sunnis around the rest of the Middle East? So the Sunni-Shia conflict is important, but it may not be important in the way that sometimes we all think it is. It's not a disagreement over theology that causes people to go to war. It's modern states like Iran and Iraq and Saudi Arabia and the others, which are either dominant of one or the other, that use the religion as an excuse to go to war for control of the region. So the extremists like Al-Qaeda and ISIS which are Sunni in this case, do want a religious caliphate in the Middle East. But they do not believe in states. They're not part of the Westphalian system that goes back to 1644 and the idea of a modern nation state. They just want one big area of a religious caliphate. In that case, they would eliminate Saudi Arabia and Iran, right? So it's more about power here in the end, I think. And when the Iranians came to power in 1979, particularly the extreme mullahs that run the country today after a, a, a topsy-turvy re revolution. They envisioned exporting the revolution and it did have a religious component. You're not wrong there, that's very important. And this is why Houthis and uh, Hezbollah groups are Shia, but it also supports Sunni groups like Hamas, which is a, a, a Muslim Brotherhood chapter. Um, and it has been known to support other Sunni groups. And so it's not a direct religious conflict, it's which of these groups will work to further the ends of Iran's national interests. So, um, you know, the other important thing is that both Saudi Arabia and Iran have been working to normalize relations, and those are the two power centers outside of Israel, but in the Middle East proper, those are the two power centers on either side of the Gulf. Um, and, uh, there we go, and, uh, and one is Sunni and one is Shia. And, and, and they have discovered that it's better to trade and have good relations than it is to fight over religion. And in fact, Mohammed bin Salman, MBS, has actually kicked to the curb the extreme Sunni religious leadership um, known as the Wahhabists in Saudi Arabia in, in, in interest of developing and diversifying Saudi Arabian economy, which he knows he needs uh, Iran's help with. Uh, and so, yes, there's always this religious component. I don't want to downplay it or say it's unimportant. But I think in the end of the day, this is much more about traditional state power than it is about, about religion per se. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. Whenever discussions of the Middle East come up, the elephant in the room is oil. Uh, we have not touched on that here today, which is a little surprising. But I'm wondering if the seeming rush to electric cars throughout the Western world has anything to do with that. So that's a good question. So I actually did mention oil. Um, uh, I did say that one of our primary reasons to be in the Middle East is to ensure the flow of Brent crude. So um, yes, we're there for the oil. And you know, when my students say, oh, it's just for the oil, that's all why we're in the Middle East, to which I say, duh, yeah, that's why we're there. Why? Because oil matters. The world runs on oil, right? Militaries run on oil. The industrial economy runs on oil. And world markets are pegged to oil markets. And so when the oil sneezes, the rest of the markets get a cold. We may not like it, but that is the reality. And so, and oil ain't going away anytime soon. So, um, uh, at least in my understanding of how energy is developing. So we are there to ensure the flow of oil to make sure that our partners, our allies, um, and, and others around the world, uh, that, the, that the international global economy works. Uh, and that seems to be pretty important to me. So I, I, don't, I, I see that actually as a strength for the United States to ensure the flow of that rather than, than a critique. Um, electric cars are probably driving, to get to the more substantive part of your um, of your question. I think electric cars are probably driving some of this, 
but the but the the minerals, the rare earths that go into the batteries that produce electric cars, don't come from the Middle East. They come from Africa. Here in the United States, we have some. Um, uh, South America, um, um, th these places. Um, my own view is that electric cars are not the future. They're a bridge to the future. Electric hydrogen is probably, the, or excuse me, liquid hydrogen is probably the future. Um, electric cars are cumbersome. They are poor in cold weather. They are extremely heavy. Their batteries don't last very long. And there's a huge fight over the, already over the minerals, which are in short supply. Um, and uh, what are we going to do with all those batteries in eight years when your Tesla runs dry? Um, and so they're not rechargeable after a while. So I, I think it's just a bridge. So I don't, I don't know to what extent, I mean, I'm not trying to duck your question, but I, I don't know what, to what extent the electric cars are driving the conflict here other than they're connected to the world markets here. And that's the best I can do. So I, I feel like I've punted on that one, sir. So I'm sorry, I, I feel like I'm letting you down, but yeah. So um, you haven't really spoken about Saudi Arabia and their okay. place in the scene. And secondly, um, when we hear talk of Israelis bombing Iran, mm -hmm. I guess is, it, is there a potential that, that this situation could become very explosive in Israel and Iran could develop into a real conflict. Yes, there is. That potential is there, right? I'll get to the Saudi question. But just to reiterate, if I didn't make it clear, that is one of the conflicts that's going on. I said U.S. and Israel with Iran, but Israel lives in the neighborhood. And so Israel is very concerned. If Iran's number one foreign policy goal is to eradicate Israel, of course Israel has engaged in all kinds of strikes from taking out its nuclear scientists by you know, drive-by shootings from motorcycles and put car bombs underneath with magnets and uh, um, AI-generated um, uh, automatic firing weapons in pickup trucks where there's nobody around but a, a physicist drives by and, and he's killed. I mean, it's gruesome stuff. The, the, the Israelis have been very clever, but they're just, they're just buying time, right? What they're afraid of, of course, is Iran getting a, a bomb, a nuclear weapon. And uh, of course, Israel is the only nuclear-armed state in, in the Middle East. Um, if Iran gets one, then Saudi Arabia is going to get one. And so um, this is why the greater concern, I think, is, is keeping Iran's nuclear weapons program under wraps. Now, of course, Iran denies that it has a nuclear weapons program. It just said it has a nuclear energy program. But we all know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, that that's, that's not the case. Now, what about Saudi Arabia? Okay, so Saudi Arabia, I agree, is a linchpin here. If we're going to have normalized relations between Palestinians and, um, and Israel, uh, then Saudi Arabia plays a crucial role here. And for many decades, um, both Arab capitals, including uh, in Saudi Arabia, but throughout the Middle East, and the Arab street, as it's colloquially known, were very much in favor of attacking Israel and uh, pushing it into the sea. And so you have the 48 war, the 67 war, the 73 war, and other skirmishes, depending on how you want to count. But in recent decades, Arab states, particularly since 1979 and the peace agreement between e uh, Egypt and Israel, and then later Jordan signed on, and certainly since the Abraham Accords a few years ago, other Arab states, but especially Saudi Arabia, have come <laughs> around to the view that trying to get is rid of Israel is not worth it. And instead, they are willing to recognize Israel because Israel, well, is a massive economic success. It has an extremely impressive high-tech sector. It exports all kinds of agricultural products. And it makes other industrial goodies. And so it has turned this barren desert into, uh, into a paradise. Uh, and Saudi Arabia realizes under Mohammed bin Salman that if he wants to diversify his own economy and move away from oil, right, then he will need to trade not just with Iran, but with Israel too, and with Turkey, and with other major players in the region. And we haven't talked about Turkey either. Um, but Saudi Arabia is the linchpin because it is the major Arab state. It is the most powerful one. If the Israelis and the, and, and, and the Saudis normalize relations, and that sets the two on a path towards stability and even full recognition, diplomacy, and all kinds of economic uh, and cultural and intellectual and uh, exchanges, that's the end of the reason for Hamas. 
That's the end of the reason uh, for Hezbollah. And one of the theories out there is why Hamas attacked was because they saw the Abraham Accords a few years ago, and they saw the ongoing talks between Israel and, uh, and Saudi Arabia, backed by the United States, as undermining uh, the Palestinians. Because if the rest of the Arab states normalize relations with Israel, what happens to the Palestinians? They get forgotten. And, they, and, and then no one talks about a two-state solution anymore. So without the Arabs backing the Palestinians, and some people believe Palestinians are just Arabs living in what used to be called Palestine, right, before the British mandate ended. Uh, and, and so I think Saudi Arabia is a linchpin here, absolutely. Now it's my belief that the Israelis and the Saudis will in fact reach those normalizations. So I'm actually sanguine about this. I'm, I'm, I'm not optimistic, but I'm guardedly hopeful that they will get there because all the pieces are in place in Israel and Saudi Arabia and even Iran recognize that trade is better here than war. But Iran is still holding on to the old cards here. And so they continue to support these groups. Does that help answer your question? Okay, great. Yeah, the, thank you for this talk. It's very, very good, very informative. Um, I was just kind of curious about the pro-democracy movement in Iran, and if you can maybe uh, give some comments about that. And my observation is every uh, time a new president is elected, usually in the first year of their administration, there's a kind of a wave of pro-democracy activism, and <clears throat> then it just kind of peters out, and you don't hear about it again for another three to eight, you know, three to seven years until the next president comes along. Uh, I think that's a good observation. Um, so I think the general view is that the only thing that's going to save Iran are Persians, right? Our Iranians themselves. Uh, a regime change we've learned in Iraq, not the way to go, right? And if we thought Iraq was bad, Iran will be 10 times worse, right? Um, their military is for real, unlike the Iraqi military. Um, uh, they have many more millions of people and they have much more hardware and they're much more better trained and disciplined. That would be an absolute nightmare. Um, so uh, the only way that the regime is going to go in Iran is uh, if it self implodes, which is possible, give enough rope, right? It is, it, it, they, do, they, they, they can engage in overreach. And they are trying to avoid that overreach right now. This is why they've called in the militias and told them to stop attacking the United States and Israel. Because they, 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 they get what Biden is doing. He's trying to reestablish deterrence. And if there's more attacks and more Americans start to get killed and wounded, then we will start getting more aggressive in our military attacks. And Iran doesn't want that. Iran wants to avoid war. It was traumatized by the war with Iraq in the 1980s, which had gas, mustard gas used, and a million people were lost on both sides. There were missile strikes in both cities, and there was a tanker war in the Gulf. So Iran has these, national, these aggressive national foreign policy objectives, but it doesn't want to directly take it on. Uh, that's why it has these militias. So it doesn't really want to get into war, but it walks right up to the edge with these militias. So it, the leadership could overstep at some point, and then there could be, they could uh, sort of have a coup within. The leader right now is thought to be ailing and perhaps dying slowly, uh, and so they have to have another um, changing of the guard, and sometimes those don't go well. Um, so we'll see what secession looks like. But I think most people think that this regime is well entrenched, it's disciplined, it's well funded, um, it's heavily armed, and it's very much in control of the country. And that the only thing that's really going to ever bring it down is a, is a revolution from the bottom up rather than a palace coup. And that would be protests in the streets. Now, the one hopeful thing I have there is that each time we do see rising up from Persians, uh, Iranians in the streets, there are more of them and there are more kinds of them. So it's not just students on campuses, which is important, but it's also working class people. And it's not just in Tehran, but it's in small cities. And it's not just you know, by the ocean or the wealthy areas, but in working class and poverty and run down areas, which suggests then that the discontent is widespread. And it is partially because of Western sanctions, which have taken a huge bite out of most everyday living for Iranians. And they live much, much farther below um, um, uh, uh, the line that they could be living in. This is a highly educated, highly talented country. Can you imagine what it would be like for a very young country where over 60% of the people are younger than 35, who know computers, who speak foreign languages, who love American culture, 
who want to be part of the west who want to be part of the cosmopolitan international crowd if we could just get rid of the mullahs well and something called the iranian guards revolutionary forces which own their their corporation they own 30 to 40 percent of all assets in iran so simply a change in regime you know the military is powerful so i i don't know whether it's really ever going to happen but the the iranian experts that i follow they to a t say it's got to be a revolution from the bottom up are we at time sir okay one more is what i hear julie well, I'm happy to stay after and talk to you individually. What is Russia's role in the area? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Russia is strangely silent on a lot of these, partly because it's spending a lot of resources fighting an unwinnable war in Ukraine. Russia can't win the war in Ukraine. Ukrainians can't win the war in Ukraine. But they're both determined to achieve their objective, so they're going to keep fighting. And so there's been upwards of 500,000 casualties in Ukraine. Russia's, spending, Russia, Russia's getting weapons from Iran right now. That's how desperate it is. Even though it has multiple industrial um, weapons centers turning out 155 millimeter shells all the time, it's getting its drones and some missiles from Iran, partly which it sold and helped give them the technology decades ago, although the drones are Iranian technology. It's also buying weapons from North Korea. So Russia's desperate. Now, it played a larger role in Syria during the Syrian civil war after the Arab Spring, which did not work out so well for the Syrians, as we all know. Um, and so Russia was active there. Syria is Russia's ally. Iran is Russia's ally. Maybe a few others. But Russia just doesn't have really the resources right now um, to, to do much in this region. So it's actually sort of um, oddly quiet right now. And that's a good thing because <laughs> we don't want any more Russian meddling. It's already trying to change the borders in Europe since 1945, right? And so, um, you know, the strategy there, I think, in Ukraine is to keep the Russians, um, you know, their strategy in warfare is to throw men and shells at problems, but that's costly. And so the longer they do that, the more it costs Russia. So the, the weaker Russia gets, and it is a declining state, and Putin is driving it down even further, the worse it gets for Russian influence around the globe. Now, this is not to say they don't have spy bases and networks and deals and alliances and partnerships with countries around the world. It's just that they don't have the resources or the focus or the, the time, it takes time to run a war in Ukraine, right? To invest in these the way they had before. So in a way that gives the US more leverage to do what they need to do. So there's an opportunity here. I think I want to come audit one of your classes. Yes. <laughs> you are allowed to audit classes at WashU, and I do get auditors who would love to have you. Dr. Knapp, thank you. This has been wonderful, and uh, we really appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure. You're a great group. Thank you. Great questions.